Let me invite you to open our Bibles, Daniel, the first chapter, Daniel chapter 1, a text that is dear to me, all of the book of Daniel. I enjoy the study of Daniel, had the privilege of preaching through it verse by verse for less than 100 years, and uh, have enjoyed each uh, moment of that. But let me kind of set the stage before we read chapter 1, 21 verses in Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. In the Sunday school class, a teacher asked a young lad to read something from the book of Daniel. He chose the sixth chapter, and he started reading in the sixth chapter of Daniel. As he read in that text, Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, and when he came to verse 3, he read, mistakenly read the verse. He said, Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because he had an excellent spine in him. <laughs> Rather than said, excellent spirit, an excellent spine in him. And that's the focus of the text. Daniel took a stand. And may I say to each and every one of us today, we're finding a greater need for Christians to take a stand in the society in which we're living even if we have to stand alone. We need to stand for truth, even if we have to stand to death. We need to take a stand for that which is biblical from the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. I find today that most Christians have the philosophy just like the world that we need to go along to get along. And that's simply not biblically correct. We need to understand the dark day in which we're living. But can you imagine now in this text, and according to those theological minds that are smarter than mine, they say that these uh, young lads that were taken into captivity were between 13 and 18 years of age. No one has an exact age for them. But Daniel as a young man being taken captive, he's in a foreign land. Mom and dad's not there to watch. Sunday school teacher's not there to watch pastor's not there to watch, and yet he makes a decision that pleases God, and he stands on that decision, even standing alone. In fact, someone has recently called that uh, the first health mandate, the first health mandate. And may I say to you, we see what is taking place today with the different mandates that's being handed down, and we need to have courage to take a stand. I probably read, researched, three to 5,000 articles on the subject of the mandate, and most are not aware of the fact that the health mandate that's supposed to be given by uh, the Oval Office, the Manchurian president that's in the Oval Office that does not have cognitive ability to make a decision, but he's the puppet, and yet uh, there are folks today across America that think that there is a health mandate that is required he is not given a directive. He's not given an executive order. It's never been put in written form. It's never been codified. And yet because he said it, all of the merchants, most of the merchants in America, and the medical professions, et cetera, et cetera, they think that it's a mandate that we've got to adhere to, that we've got to bow and to bend to be in compliance with it. I believe this is a test, by the way, to see what we will bow for, what we will bow to, and how much we will submit to it before the next test comes about. And if we fail this test, we've lost America. And so I believe this text that is before us today has power and suggestive influence in our lives if we'd allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to us in relationship to what we need to do and what we see today. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. Daniel, the first chapter... Verses 1 through 21, let me read that aloud and you follow with me silently in your scripture. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. I want you to notice in that second verse a very poignant point or statement. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, unto the hands. It's the Lord that's done it with the part of the vessels of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom would be 
was no blemish, but well favored. Notice now the qualifications that Daniel falls under. Children whom there was no blemish, well favored, and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, as such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that was going to be the test time, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among them were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Meshel, and Azariah, unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for they gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and the Hananiah of Shadrach, and Meshel of Meshach, and of Azariah of Abednego. Verse 8, but, change of direction, contrast. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which uh, he drank. Thereof he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the princes of the eunuchs. And the princes of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear, my lord, the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for whom, for why should he see your faces worse likened than the children which are of your sorts? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel unto the Mas uh, Maslar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, and Ar Ar Azariah, prove thy servant, I'm having to go through my yellow writing, uh, prove thyself, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse, that is vegetables. This is not a vegetarian diet spoken of here. Uh, pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and uh, the countenance of the children eat, uh, that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and they see, and seeth that with the servant, deal with the servant. So he contented to them in this matter consented to them in this manner, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink, and gave them pulse or vegetables. Verse 17 through 21 wraps up the apex of the text. As for these four children. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and in wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days the king had said should bring them in the end, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found more than more like none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all the realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Thank you, and we may be seated. It's a wonderful study in the book of Daniel, in particular as we're looking at this first chapter. As we look at this first chapter, we're talking about the, uh, what takes place today. And most of you are aware of the fact that in our uh, schools, our liberal scholars have the mindset, the attitude that somehow, some way, they can uh, criticize and demean uh, those uh, sons and daughters that were placed in the colleges and universities. And uh, a, an approach is taken to try to unlearn them, uh, put them in uh, some type of uh, concentration camp, if you will, re-educational camps, which our high educational system today is simply a re-educational system, uh, where there's a mindset that we're going to change their mind, redirect their lives, and give them uh, something other than an honor of God in what they say and do. We can look at that in the book of Daniel and see a similar statement here, a similar thing that is found where uh, they are taken captive, and the mindset of the captors is to change them completely by changing the name, changing what they are, uh, the names that they're called, changing their diet, changing their customs, changing all that they do and say to assimilate them into a pagan culture. 
That's the mindset as we study this text. We need to keep that uppermost in mind, that that is the focus, that's what's being attempted, and that's what they have as their schedule and agenda. Uh, God used Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his armies to besiege Jerusalem and returned with captives from the royal families. All of these that they brought into captivity were those that were learned and trained, educated, and had a stand for God and an honor of the God of the universe. Years ago, many boys and girls will sing a song. Some of you might remember that. Dare to be, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. That was a pretty good song back in that era. You don't hear those songs today. But I want us to notice three things very briefly as we look at this text. 21 verses. We're going to look at it as an overview. In some verses we will uh, exegete uh, uh, in depth. Time will not allow us to do that in all 21 verses. But we'll cover it pretty succinctly today. We'll notice the deportation of Daniel recorded, the devotion of Daniel revealed, and the dedication of Daniel rewarded. His dedication is firmly rewarded by God, and he's honored in the work that he is placed in. Notice the deportation of Daniel recorded in verses 1 through 7. I call it the pernicious deportation. It's pernicious. That is, uh, there is a hostility and a wickedness behind it. Verse 1 and 2, God used Nebuchadnezzar, as we'll notice in the text, to take the children of Israel into captivity into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar actually came into uh, Judah three different times. Let me just give you a little historic setting so we'll understand the place and the custom and the uh, character of what is taking place. In 605 B.C., he took a few captives into Babylon along with the loot and the treasure. That time in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar left uh, in 605 B.C. The second time he came into, in 597, and when the prophet Ezekiel was exiled into Babylon, Ezekiel knew about Daniel and he referred to him three times in the book of Ezekiel, understanding that this was a current understanding in those prophets or writing of that time. The third invasion was 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. I think my historical dates are absolutely correct from the conservative standpoint. There are a lot of writers today that are writing commentaries on the book of Daniel, and they give Daniel a late date in writing, claiming that these things had to have already taken place before Daniel wrote them, and therefore he just was a redactor. He went back and read what had taken place and then wrote the text about it. That's simply not true. He was a prophet of God, and he wrote throughout the book of Daniel those things that were taking place and those things that should take place in the future. The taking of the vessels from the temple was to prove the gods of Babylon were stronger than the God of the universe. That was the purpose of taking the vessels out of the uh, temple. And may I say today, the government today has the same idea, that the government is going to be a god, and we need to bow to the god of government, not the god of the universe, the mindset of our present government. And now listen very carefully. I'm not anti-government. I take a position that uh, there are a lot of folks today as Christians that are, are a little anemic, illiterate, in some cases you just say dumb in relationship to what government's about. They'll go back and say, well, preacher, don't you realize in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, the Bible says that we ought to obey government. Read that text very carefully. You'll find that government is ordained of God as a slave servant of God to protect good and prosecute evil. When you reverse that and it's antithetical to the Word of God and it's antithetical to our Constitution, there's not one thing that says as a child of God, as a Christian, as a conservative, as a patriot, we ought to bow and bend and say yes to the government if it's going to be antithetical to what the Word of God says. I have taken the position for less than 100 years now, my responsibility is first and foremost to God, to stand on the Word of God, stand on what God's Word says regardless of what the world says and regardless of what government says, we ought to obey God. And this is so clear and evident it's in this text and in fact throughout the book of Daniel we find that to be true. We need to recognize in the text that is before us it was God that gave Nebuchadnezzar the victory. It was God that put him in control. It was God that allowed this to take place. And I made a little marginal footnote. What if God today is putting America in the position of being taken captive by China or Russia or Iran as a result of our denial of God, which started back in 1960 and 61 and following, where we kicked God out of the classroom, we kicked prayer out of the classroom, and basically in 2016, the Democratic Party didn't even want to have the name God in their platform at all. 
And Jerry Nadler recently said, speaking as one of the House members was reading from the Scripture uh, before the uh, House in uh, Assembly, uh, then Jerry Nadler spoke up and says, God has no, God's Word has no place in the U.S. Capitol. We basically dethrone God and kick God out of uh, everything that's done politically speaking. And somehow, some way, we think as a nation that we're still wonderful and we're still strong, but we're not unless God is there on the throne. And we find that it's God that carried this out, and it was for the punishment of Israel because of what they had done. In fact, it was in 605 B.C., which is the beginning of the time of the Gentiles, and this will continue until Jesus raptures the church out of this old world. May I remind us today that God demands obedience, and he will get it either by choice or by captivity, without any reservation. Secondly, not only the pernicious deportation, but notice the powerful directive in verse 3 and 4. The king gives a directive. He gives instructions. He gives a command for the master of the eunuchs, that is the captain chief officer in charge of all the captives. He was to go out and search out all of the captives. He was to go out and examine them and find certain of the children of Israel, listen, certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and the princes. Listen to what the prerequisites were in finding these captives. Verse 4, notice the king did not want just anybody. King just not, did not want a dummy. He did not want those that were viewed as being dropouts or misfits. He chose young men, young men of poise and personality who were brilliant and brisk and handsome and healthy and resourceful and had a responsive nature that could serve in the king's palace. Now, when you look at what is taking place in America today, you find that Multitudes of those in the Beltway in Washington are in the category of what you would call the elitist with the mindset that I have a Yale, Harvard, Princeton, or Brown University degree, and as a result of that, I'm smarter than the rest of the dummies in the nation that we need to tell them what to do and how they need to live. We need, them to, need to even tell them where, what they need to inject in their bodies. We need to tell them what, when, and how they can worship or if they can worship. There's that mindset that pervades, and it's not new today. It's simply a recycling of what's been taking place for centuries, and we see it here in this text very clearly that the mindset was we want those to records that those that are handsome and healthy and smart. Notice the physical attractiveness. The children in whom was no blemish, but well favored. Listen to what the scripture is saying. Those that are not only smart, but those that look handsome, those that look good, those that have a good stature, those that have a uh, smart appearance as they would face the world. Not only physical attractiveness, but notice the perceptive academically. Uh, and skillful in all wisdom and cunning, that is astute and sharp in knowledge and understanding of science. He not only wanted those who were physically attractive, but sharp and academically perceptive. That's those that the king sought out. That's the uh, character and the conduct that the king was looking for in those that were brought into captives that he wanted to be serving in the king's palace. Now keep in mind, we'll see in just a moment, the prince of the eunuchs were to search these out bring them in. They were to eat the king's food and the king's drink for three years, and then they would all be examined. Three years is a pretty long period of time for them to be tested and tried and proven, but that was the case. Not only to be physically attractive and perceptive academically, but personally astute, and such as had ability to stand, ability in them to stand in the king's palace. Notice in that uh, personal astuteness, the king didn't want to be embarrassed. He didn't want to have someone that didn't have personality and poise. And may I say today, it's true in those political positions today, they feel that they, because they're elite, that somehow, some way, that they're head and shoulders above the general citizens in America. That's one of the problems that we have. We have a bifurcation of American citizenship today. Those that are in the Beltway in Washington have the mindset that we're kings and princes, and as I call it, potentates, and as a result of that, we're here to make the decision. You just simply must follow it. That's simply an unbiblical prerequisite for society today. The prerequisites were that they were to be physically attractive, perceptive academically, personally astute, and the fourth thing in verse 4, potential in that aptitude. They have great potential in the attitude. Notice what the scripture said, in whom they might teach the learning and tongue, that's the language, of the Chaldeans. In other words, we want them that are smart, super brilliant, those that we can re-educate to what we want them to be. 
those that we can put in the re-education camp and make them do what we're saying. We are today guinea pigs in America, not only physically, not only with the uh, uh, health-wise, but we're guinea pigs today in the incubator of social change. That's the reason in Washington they're viewed as being the woke society. Well, I think it's time the church got woke. I think that it's time we as Christians wake up and understand what is taking place in our society today. And yet there's the mindset that we want those that are woke. If you're not woke, you're not in the in crowd in our nation and in our society. That potential aptitude was that they wanted those that were learnable, that were trainable. The king wanted sharp, young, moldable minds. He planned to brainwash them that they would undergo total transformation. They were to learn everything about Babylonian life, living, and society. This is the reason it's going to take three years to go through the educational, re-educational camp in Daniel's day. This is the reason it's going to take three years for them to train, do all of the training. This happens to the young minds even today. This happens to the young minds in our colleges and universities. You might say, well, preacher, are you against higher education? Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. If it's in the state-controlled mindset of the universities and colleges. You can ask our four sons that they, we told them as they were growing up, I'd rather have you grow up as a dummy academically and know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord than go to every university that nation has to offer. I am here to say I am for homeschooling. I'm here to tell you that I'm for Christian education. I'm for moms and dads that will train sons and daughters, but so often we do that, and then by the time they're out of high school, we want to put them in one of these re-educational camps called colleges and universities that will destroy their mind and their integrity and their lives, their morals, because the 97%, that was the survey several years ago, it could be 100% today, 97% of the college and university professors say that they're there to remove what mom and dad has taught them which is incorrect if it's about God. They're there to brainwash them and they're proud of their brainwashing abilities in those colleges and universities. This is what's taking place today. Some of the smartest minds in America today are atheist minds and attitudes that we're going to change you and make you like we are. I understand the things that were taking place in their uh, society in Daniel's day, mentally and psychologically and socially and spiritually. They were to change them, brainwash them, and re-educate them in what they wanted to take place in their lives. They wanted to, them to think differently so that they were going to teach them a new language, a new literature, and that of the Chaldeans. Our minds are molded today by what we read and what we study. I was recently talking with an individual, a professional person in our city. My wife and I had an opportunity to spend about a half hour with him. And he said, and I, this is unique, he said, I am a born-again Christian Catholic. <laughs> born-again Christian Catholic. He has a testimony of truly being saved. And he says his idea is to be able to be in that particular denomination to try to lead others to Jesus Christ. But he said, uh, well, uh, years ago, he said, I used to wake up every morning and watch uh, an hour of news. He said, it destroyed my day. He said, now I wake up in the morning and I spend an hour in reading the Word of God and studying the Scripture. By the way, he said, uh, told me, he said, preach, I listen to you preach every Sunday morning while I'm getting ready to go to school, church, <laughs> on the radio broadcast. But he said, he loves the Lord. But the focus and the point that I wanted us to understand, he stopped watching the news every morning and started reading the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, reading the word of God. He said, it's changed my mind. It's changed my attitude. It's changed my life. We become what we read, what we watch, and what we listen to, what we adhere to. And the mindset today is that we ought not to study the word, ought not to spend time in the word. These young men had been taught and trained in Jewish social thought and literature. They followed the law of God. They were trusting in God. They were dependent upon God. They were now be, to be trained in the way of the world. Many today are brought uh, away from the word and into the world and destroying their lives. They were taught to love the Lord. We're talking about uh, Daniel and his three friends. They were taught to love God. They were taught to love the scripture, if you will, and live for God instead of the word. And then so often, as we see in this text, when uh, they're taken out of the home, what's expected of them? Multitudes will say, well, you know, they, you just need to go along to get along. And Daniel didn't have that attitude at all. 
He had the attitude before God that I'm going to stand if I have to stand alone. The secular garbage dump today, as I said a moment ago, it's called the college and universities, are training our boys and girls, our sons and daughters, to hate God, to hate the Word, and to be absolutely against anything that's called Christianity. According to the Barner Report, less than 4% of the 18 to 35-year-olds today have any biblical worldview at all. Only 4%, 18 to 35-year-old age group. If you're in that category and you're here today, you're different. But 18 to 35-year-old age group, only 4% with a biblical worldview. We must decide, as Daniel did, we must decide not to defile ourselves with the world and what the world has to offer. Every child of God, every Christian ought to be different. We ought to stand out different. We ought to walk different, act different, talk different. You've heard me say before, at the risk of redundancy, I'll say again, we ought to even smell different. <laughs> if we've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, that's what Daniel did. Standing alone. Not only the prerequisites, but I want you to notice the process in verses 5 through 7. They were going to bring about the change in the young men's lives through a change of diet and a change of designation. A change of diet and a change of designation. They were going to change their food. Now, by the way, there are a lot of Christians that love this text. In fact, there are a lot of those charlatans on television that will sell you the Daniel diet so that you can lose weight based on the Daniel diet. God never intended it to be a diet plan for society even today. They were going to bring about the change in these young men's lives. In chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, the scripture says, looking at verse 5, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. We have a Governmental system today that wants to tell us what we're supposed to eat as far as our diet. They want to tell us uh, what kind of educational process we need to go through. They are now wanting to tell us what we need to do for our own physical bodies as far as what we inject or do not inject in our system and what kind of medications we're allowed to take. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but I've probably got uh, about 50 to 75 articles where across the nation we have physicians where they're being threatened to have their license revoked if they offer any, or write a prescription for ivermectin or for hydroxychloroquine or any other uh, efficacious drug that's beneficial for uh, the, uh, uh, what is it called, the Emperor Fauci's uh, disease or uh, virus, uh, we need to understand that that's exactly what's taking place today. There's a mindset today that they can tell us what to eat, what to drink, what to do, and what we need to place in our bodies. The change of designation also in verse 6 and 7, these four young men, each between 13 and 18 years of age, had godly names. Names that identified them as followers of God. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Meshel, who is what God is. Who is what God is. Azariah, Yahweh has helped. Those were the names that these had were identified as godly people. The names both new and old had significance in expressing the religious convictions. Belteshazzar, for example, refers to the prince of Baal, the highest of the Babylonian gods. And then instead of the Lord's protection of Daniel's accountability to God, they wanted him to appear to be a pagan person and uh, look at it as the pagan god that's going to protect his life and not the god of the universe. Hananiah changed to Shadrach, referring to Rach, the son deity. It means to uh, be illuminated by the sun deity. Picture, listen, I want us to understand what is taking place. We're going to change your diet. We're going to change your name so that you fully identify with the cultic world that you're in today. And we are finding that more and more in our society today, a denigration of what is called godliness and holiness in our nation, in our land. Then when Michelle changed to uh, Meshach, which means who is what Ask you, that's A-K-U is, that's one of their gods, referring to the pagan god. Instead of being reminded to live like the Lord and serve him, he would be reminded instead of the pagan deity by which he would be named. Azariah means Yahweh the Lord has helped, was changed to Abednego, which is derived from Nebo, which is another of the gods of Babylon and means a servant of Nebo. You notice what they're doing? Changing what they eat, changing what their, uh, their names and the designation of that name so that they would be totally separated, totally divested of, totally uh, removed from the God of the universe and their names recognizing their God and who they served. 
The plan was to change these young men so radically and so totally in literature and language and learning that they would turn from the God of the universe to serve the pagan God of the Babylonian Empire of that day. We must confront the culture that we live in. Today, more than ever in the history as I know it, I'm still less than 100 years old. <laughs> Our culture today is corrupt. Our conduct is corrupt. The loose, lax, lost living has robbed our youth of their Christian heritage that we have shed blood for so many years for in our nation to be free. If you can't stand against the crowd, if you can't stand against this that's pushing today, you'll never learn to be a leader in a small, small way. It's important that we have things in our life in order that we follow what God's Word says regardless of what the world might say. We must stand today for truth, even if I have to stand alone, even if I have to stand alone. Satan hasn't changed his targets or tactics one bit. Same targets, same tactics that we find in Daniel, Daniel also taking place in society today. These four young men, in the way they thought about God, wanted, they wanted to change. God of the world in general is what is being used today. Secularism of the world. Instead of realizing God's word, uh, they were going to be made to read pagan literature and follow pagan culture and the pagan gods. You read pagan li literature today and uh, it's going to change your life. You read the word of God today and it'll change your life. The decision must be made individually. Not only we see the deportation of Daniel recorded, but notice the devotion of Daniel revealed, verses 8 through 16, the bulk of the text. Notice what the text is saying. I want us to follow it. Notice the personal decision in verse 8, the personal decision. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank thereof. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Listen to what the scripture is saying. But Daniel purposed in his heart. I want us to understand it takes a volitional, purposeful decision. Even before we have to answer, we need to have already made that decision in our hearts and in our lives of how we're going to respond, of what we're going to do, of the stand that we're going to take. You need to make a purposeful de decision today. Either we're going to stand and serve God or government. We're going to stand and bow to God or to government. We're going to stand and say, not me and my house, as was said uh, by one that you look at in the 24th chapter of Joshua, but it's for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord. That ought to be the decision we make in advance, and that's what we see with Daniel. Daniel is away from home. He's just a teenager in a foreign land. He's not subject to any parental rule. He's not subject to anybody looking over what he's doing. He's not subject to anything that's pressing from family relationship, but he's making a decision based on his relationship to God and knowing what God's law says. That ought to be what we instill in every son and daughter. That ought to be the mindset that we instill in every child that we have the opportunity to impact in our lives. Daniel made a purposeful decision. He made a decision of what he was going to take into his body. He made a decision as to whether or not he was going to take the king's vaccination or not. Let me just read you a paragraph from one writer on this subject that was so profound in the way he wrote it. The elites represented here by Nebuchadnezzar have their own ideas about what is best for common people and assume for themselves the right to impose their will by force. The particulars of the mandate represented in Daniel 1 by certain foods and wine are about whether or not to allow substances into our bodies against our wills. The motive of the people and Daniel and his three companions, to resist the mandate is religious in nature. The government enforcement mechanism represented by overseer is coercive, implementing by, implemented by uh, uh, immediate, uh, intermediate areas, such as private businesses, which face serious penalties for not serving as health police over the custody customers or clients. The solution then as is now a request for religious exemption backed by the implicit promise of civil disobedience. And in the end, 
just as they proved by today's non-vaxxers, Daniel's choice not to submit to the mandate was vindicated by his superior health status as compared to those who did. Daniel's position proved strong, uh, proved strong support for the Christian doctrine of personal bodily sovereignty and not bowing to government demands, end quote. I couldn't have written it better myself. That's exactly what Daniel is doing. How did Daniel come to these convictions? How did Daniel come to this? Because he was trained in the word of God. He was trained in the word of God even as a teenager. He knew what to believe and what to do. And I say today, parents ought to have the mindset that I'm going to instill in my sons and daughters that willingness to stand even if you have to stand alone to obey God. That's what we need to understand in our nation today. They can't stand alone on the basics of parental conviction, the peer pressures, temptations will push them into a different direction unless they are embedded with the training that we give them through the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. Notice not only the personal decision, notice the pressing dilemma in verses 8 through 10, the pressing dilemma. Notice the request, therefore he requested, Daniel requested, of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel didn't demand it. Daniel didn't say that here I am big and strong. Daniel says, may I have a religious exemption? Daniel said, may I turn in my religious exemption request and see if the king will honor that? He said, may I? Daniel asked for a religious exemption. Daniel didn't want to be want to defile himself with the king's luxury and lust. Daniel knew that the word of God said that we ought not to have strong drink. He knew that meat would be against the Mosaic law because it was prepared by Gentiles and it had been offered to the pagan gods of that day. We see the request, but notice the reticence on the part of the prince of the eunuchs. Verse 9 and 10. First of all, I want us to realize God is honored when we stand, even if we stand alone. God is honored for that stand. Hospitals across the nation today are in dire condition because they took the position that we're going to force you into the mold that we demand. There are hospitals in Houston, Texas today that's operating at the critical level because they do not have enough doctors and nurses. There are hospitals today across America that's having to shut down their maternity wards because they do not have enough nurses. There are hospitals today that if you go into them will probably be dangerous because of not enough medical staff to take care of and protect your life because of what's been done on the basis that we're going to tell you what to inject in your body. Now, listen very carefully. If you want to get the vaccination, wonderful, do so. I'm personally against it. I'm personally against what the government is saying that we ought to do. I believe that it's a personal volitional choice as to what we place into our bodies. And Daniel is a good prerequisite here, is a good example of what we understand that needs to be done today in Christian lives. It is that we have the right to say what you're going to do in my body. You've heard the old cliche by the abortionist lobbyist, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that a woman has the right to her body. Well, I have a right to my body also. I have a right to make a decision what's going to be placed in it, injected in it. The few times that I've been in a hospital, on one of the occasions, the nurse walked in with a handful of pills, and she had them in a little cup, and she said, take these. I pulled one out, and I said, what is this? And she told me, I said, well, I'm not supposed to take that. She put it in uh, another little cup. She pulled another one out, and I said, well, the doctor took me off that a year ago, and she put that aside. And after we got down to the last one, I said, uh, I'm not taking it. She took the whole handful, dashed them into the sink, and walked out. Three hours later, the doctor came in. He said, good for you because you didn't need those. Somehow, some way, they'd looked at the record wrong or incorrectly, and I was just simply supposed to swallow them. There's the mindset that if we say do it, you ought to do it. And I'm here to say we need to stand, even to have to stand alone, based on the authority of the Word of God. Nothing more and nothing less. The reticence was there. The chief of the eunuchs uh, had uh, a uh, lack of understanding of what Daniel was saying. And the chief of the eunuchs was fearful that if he would do something to abide by what Daniel wanted, that somehow, some way, his neck would be in the noose. God touched the heart of the prince of the eunuchs, though, and Daniel was dependent upon the Lord. The Lord provided for him. Notice in the scriptures you study, it, it was the a fact that the scripture says there, now God, God's sovereign, it's the providence of God. Now God, verse 9, had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. God is the one that changed the heart of the prince of the eunuchs to allow that to take place. Daniel was dependent upon the Lord, and the Lord provided for him. Daniel stood, and he stood alone. The personal devotion, the pressing dilemma. Notice the plausible discernment in verses 11 through 14. God gave Daniel spiritual discernment and wisdom 
as to what he was doing. Notice the courtesy in verse 11 and 12. Daniel said, may I let us try just for 10 days. Daniel said, would you honor my religious exemption and just for 10 days would you do that? Let you test me, check me, see if it worked. He's standing alone, but he's saying, I want to have an exemption for just 10 days. He didn't say I want the exemption for three years. Three years was the test period. He said, just for 10 days, I want you to acknowledge my uh, religious exemption. Notice the courtesy there. Daniel said, may I? Daniel was uh, risking his life, but trusting God. And may I say that that's what we need to do today is trusting God with every decision we make, saying, God, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to respond? What would you have me to say in this particular circumstance and situation? There are folks today, some of the elitists on television, some of the elitists in the Beltway in Washington, that's saying the whole problem with the continuing virus today in America is because Christians, they're naming it, Christians are refusing to take the vaccination. Well, I want us to understand there's word out that only dummies and uneducated people are saying no to the vaccination. The latest survey by Barner says that uh, 72% of those that are not vaccinated have PhDs are better. 72%. There's a major, major, major problem when the finger is pointed at uh, we, the little peasant servants in America that say that somehow, some way we know better for what you need to have for your life. That's seen in this text. But Daniel is saying, not for me. I am not going to take the vaccination. I, I simply want to uh, be sovereign over my body and what I do. And he had uh, favor with the prince of the eunuchs that only God could have brought about that he was able to get his 10-day religious exemption signed, if you will, please. The plausible discernment we see in this text, the courtesy is asked. Daniel said, may I? Notice the confidence in. Daniel said, try it for 10 days. Let, just try me. Just let me uh, show you what we can do. Let us live off uh, vegetables. Let's live off spinach and collard greens and uh, butter beans uh, for, ten, for 10 days and see how that'll work. You throw in a few tomatoes and it'd be all right with me. <laughs> Daniel says, just check us out. Uh, what if it had not worked? What if it had not worked with Daniel? What if in 10 days he had been in worse condition than the others? He was trusting God. He was trusting God for the end result. He didn't want to compromise, but he was trusting God. He made a heartfelt decision, but it set the test in motion, and he knew that somehow God would do something because God wanted him to be obedient in what he said and what he did. May I say to you, there comes the time in each of our lives that we need to take a stand, even we stand alone, based on morals and ethics and values and commitment to the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. Daniel wasn't afraid. He knew that he could trust God. And may I simply say this, if we know what God's word says and we commit it to him and our hearts and lives to him, we can trust him for the end result. If we know what God wants and what God's word says, and we simply faith him, we can trust him for the end results. Now, that's a difficult position to be in. That's a difficult position to be in when we do not know what God's going to do in the end result. But we know that we know that we know that he says, Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That we know that we know that we know that we can trust him and we cannot necessarily trust others. The personal devotion, the pressing dilemma, the plausible discernment. But I want you to notice the physical demeanor found in verse 15 and 16. The 10 days are up. What happens in the 10 days? 10 days are up. He looked healthier than all of the others. God honored Daniel's devotion and dedication. Dr. Michael Guido has gone on to be with the Lord a number of years ago. Fantastic servant of God. Dr. Guido says of this particular text, his face reflected bliss and not belligerence. His eyes radiated delight, not de uh, disdain. His expression registered affection and not arrogance, end quote. That's as he identified Daniel in his stand. Thirdly, I want us to notice in conclusion, verses 17 through 21, the dedication of Daniel rewarded. Did God reward Daniel for taking that stand alone? Did God uh, uh, disallow and disavow in some fashion Daniel's faith and trust in him? And as a result of that, Daniel fell flat on his face and wound up being uh, the disdain for the whole uh, palace of the king. No, not on your life. He stood alone and God honored it. Notice the powerful distinction found in verse 17 through verse 20. God honored and blessed Daniel and his friends. Notice what the word says. And 
For these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And you understand now from this point forward what that means in relationship to Daniel being to interpret dreams and have all knowledge and interpretation of dreams and how God uses it for the balance of the book of Daniel in the life of Daniel. Now at the end of the days, the king had said he should bring them in. Uh, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in to before Nebuchadnezzar. This is three years now has passed because it said it was going to test, be a test for three years. Scripture doesn't say it, but the three years have passed. And the king communed with them. That's he communicated, talked with them. Among them he found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah stood they before the king. Then in all the matters, wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in the entire realm of the king. Listen to what the scripture is saying. God honored and blessed Daniel and his friends because of their dedication, because of their service and commitment to the Lord. And as a result of that, God honored their dedication. Notice, first of all, God gave them, quote, distinction. That's insight. Verse 17, insight. That is for standing alone, God gave them insight that others did not have in them. As for these four children, they gave them knowledge and skill in all, not some, but all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. First Samuel 2.30 says, those who have honor me, I will honor we need to honor God by standing, even if we have to stand alone. Whatever we have today in understanding and insight, it is not ours. It's on loan from God. God provides it. God provides it, and he provides it based on the degree and to the extent that we serve him and we honor him. We submit and surrender our lives unto his lordship in our lives, not only with the insight but with the intelligence, skill and all learning and wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. The wisdom of the world is devilish, demonic, the book of James tells us. So they had insight and they had intelligence. They also had influence. Verses 17 through 20, they were found 10 times better than everybody the king had in his palace. They were found 10 times better than all of the astrologers and the soothsayers and all the magicians and all of those that would interpret the king's dreams and interpret what the king would tell them to give him answers on. Daniel stood alone but he was honored for God, by God as a result of his standing alone. We are known in the terms of morals and ethics and values and integrity more by what we don't do than what we do. Did you understand that? We're recognized by our morals and values more by what we do not do than what we do. Multitudes today do not recognize the difference. We don't have anything that we haven't received from God. And when we determine in our hearts and make a volitional decision that we're going to serve God and honor God, he gives ability to stand for him and to honor him. They were not only rewarded in distinction but in duration. That 21st verse is the capstone of the text. Notice the results that in which God honored Daniel and his three friends because Daniel took that stand. And Daniel continued under the first year of King Cyrus. You go back and study it. Daniel uh, served in the palace under uh, three or four at least kings that he had the privilege of serving under as a result of honoring God. May I just wrap it up by saying Daniel's ministry in the royal court of Babylon continued until the overthrow of the Babylonian Empire by Cyrus in 539 B.C. You look at the life of Daniel, and the distinction was made when he had the opportunity to take the king's mandate for his health. And he said, no, I'm going to trust on God. No, I'm going to place my faith and trust in God. I'm not going to have anything that the king has to eat or drink. Daniel was promoted because of his dedication to God. And may I say in closing, we need to take that same stand, even if we have to stand alone. We need to say no to drugs and drink and immorality. We need to say no to what the government says we ought to do if it is against the word of God. We need to take that stand every day, every day. I'm, let me just simply wrap up by making a profound statement. You may agree or disagree. I believe that if Christians today would simply take what Daniel chapter 1 says and inculcate it in our lives, 
we could turn the world right side up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right side up. We need revival in America today more than any time in our history, in my most humble opinion. And yet Christians, for the most part, are silent. For the most part, Christians have the philosophy, I'm going to go along to get along. Rather than saying, I'm going to stand, even if it means taking my life, I'm willing to stand for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. The question begs to be asked, demands to be answered. Have you made a volitional choice to stand, even if you have to stand alone? Number one, it's an impossibility lest you've said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior Lord. It's an impossibility. We do not have the strength, the ability, the wisdom, unless it's coming from God. And the only way that is possible is to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come to my heart and save me. Help me to live for you because you died for me. Then we have that relationship to him. It's not a religion, it's a relationship whereby he empowers us to take that stand. Humanly speaking, we can't stand alone. But with the power of God through us, as a result of our relationship to God through Jesus Christ, we can take that stand and say, come what may, I'm standing for Jesus. I'm not going to bow, I'm not going to bend, but I'm going to stand for him. Would you do that today? Would you make that commitment, first of all, to say yes to Jesus? Secondly, to say, yes, I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to stand for the gospel. I'm going to stand for the word of God. I'm going to stand if I have to stand alone.